Welcome to Spectrum Sundays. I am Megan Sinisi, a Master of Health Science candidate studying to practice as a pediatric speech language pathologist. I am also Miss Central Pennsylvania and the founder of a nonprofit organization for autism titled From a New Perspective. And I am Francesca D'Alessandro, a current master's student at University of Buffalo studying speech language pathology. Additionally, I am your Miss Thousand Islands of New York State, serving my community through AAA appreciation and awareness for autism. Everyone deserves to feel accepted and included in every space they walk in. Our series aims to inspire you to advocate for yourself and on behalf of your loved ones. And we are so grateful that you're here with us today. Haley Moss made international headlines for becoming the first documented openly autistic attorney admitted to the Florida Bar. She received her Juris Doctor from the University of Miami School of Law in 2018 and graduated from the University of Florida in 2015 with her BS in Psychology and BA in Criminology and Law. Haley is the author of Great Minds Think Differently, Neurodiversity for Lawyers and Other Professionals, which is to be released in June 2021 by the American Bar Association. Her next book, The Young Autistic Adults Independence Handbook, will be available in November 2021. Haley is also the author of Middle School, The Stuff Nobody Tells You About a Freshman Survival Guide for College Students and with Autism Spectrum Disorders. Haley's work on neurodiversity, autism, and disability have also been published in national media outlets. She was appointed to the Florida Bar Young Lawyers Division Board of Governors, the Florida Bar Journal Editorial Board, and the Florida Bar Standing Committees on Diversity and Inclusion. Haley also serves on the constituency board for the University of Miami, Nova Southeastern University Center for Autism and Related Disabilities. So Haley, thank you again for being with us. We enjoyed our conversation with you on our previous episode so much. And we're really looking forward to getting to know you more as a person and about your journey through law and navigating your autism diagnosis as well. So you're a very accomplished, young and prominent public figure, both in the autism community and in law. Tell us about something that people might not know about you or that they can't find on Google about you. Maybe that's your hobbies or special interests. Bless you. <laughs> I purposely had to mute that because I'm like, oh no, sneezes are not pretty, but <laughs> something that's, so fun things about me, I really, really am kind of geeky about Taylor Swift. I love to read young adult novels. I, I spend a lot of time reading and writing, honestly. I, I play a lot of games. I just always want to do something and go adventure and have fun. I feel like at the same time, a lot of us think of public figures as this, that's all they do. And at the same time, like, I don't know, in a lot of ways, I'm your typical 20 something that wants to just go on adventures, go places, travel, get brunch with friends that like there's stuff like that, that I want to do. And sometimes I get to, and now that we're especially getting back to leaving our houses again, I'm hoping to get to do a little bit more of, but it's just, and I also love going to like group exercise classes. I love just being part of things. I love feeling like I, I feel like feeling like that there's something that, you know, I belong and there's all sorts of weird places in my life that I do. And I don't know, I'm just, I just get excited. And I, I need to get back into paint, drawing and painting more because I, I actually have always been someone who is creative and an illustrator and all that stuff. And I want to get back into it, honestly. Like I've been kind of just sidetracked over the years. Well, something that you personally told us off camera is that you have a lot to say and you have a lot to share and you mentioned a little bit about reading and we also mentioned in your introduction that you have a few books coming out mm -hmm. so I'm assuming that your inspiration to write these books and publish them is to share your experiences but could you maybe share some more insight about that inspiration about that inspiration and where you see that going for you in the future Absolutely. So I'm one of those people that I always feel like not only do I have a lot to say, but there's so much that needs to be more accessible to anyone who wants that information. And all of us learn differently. That's what I've learned over the years, and especially spending time in diversity and inclusion and accessibility spaces, is not everyone learns from listening to a podcast or watching a video. Some people need to read something or some people enjoy reading for fun or having something in their hands that they can come back to time and time again. 
So I want to, and I also just like to write. So I wanted to put everything in one place. And when I first graduated from law school, and even when I was in law school, there was absolutely zero on neurodiversity that the legal profession did not address disability or neurodiversity as a form of diversity. They still aren't always the best at it. Anytime that I try to bring my perspective to things, it's assumed that it's a health and wellness issue, not a diversity and inclusion issue. And I have to be like, hey, you know, this is a diversity issue, not just a disabled people and neurodivergent people are unwell mentally or physically and we need to fix that, that we are part of that fabric of diversity. When I was looking at diversity summer associate like positions when I was in law school, disability wasn't even part of that definition of diversity. So this was all stuff that I was thinking about through law school and beyond. And I'm like, I want to help change this conversation. And when I went viral, it was the first time I felt like that a lot of the profession was listening, is that neurodiversity was suddenly part of it. I've seen panels from the American Bar Association, from other legal organizations at the National Association for Law Placement, that all these different places were finally addressing neurodiversity and disability as diversity, rightfully so. And whether that was because of me or it was just part of that conversation that made people go, oh, we have to think about this. Like, there's no books on neurodiversity. We have lawyers and other professionals out there that have neurodivergent clients that they work with others in their offices that might also be neurodivergent. Their students There's so much that we just need to cover. And thankfully somebody didn't think I was absolutely ridiculous for wanting to write about that and to try to have that kind of guidance going forward for our profession is that's what I was really setting out to do. And when it came to young adulthood and being an adult, I realized that a lot of us aren't always feel like we don't know what we're doing. And that you somehow are forced to like go be independent. And I'm like, what does independence even mean? Independence is one of those things that I feel like we put a lot of pressure on young people with disabilities to do is that they have to suddenly do everything themselves and abandon support or else they are going to be living at home stuck in somebody's basement forever. And that's also just not true is that we are very interdependent as a society. We don't do everything by ourselves. We're not out, we're not always managing our money by ourselves. We might have a financial advisor. We might have help with a realtor to rent or buy a house. We always need help with something. We might still go to our parents and trusted other adults for advice and help with things. And that's okay. But for people with disabilities, we're told if you're not independent, that you're not doing it. So for me, I wanted to kind of explore that and also do a lot of advice and practical things as well so that you can figure out how to like manage your money or how to handle rejection or even just how to, how do you handle jobs or do you negotiate? Do you do this? Like all these things that are just unwritten rules. And I wanted to spell it out for young autistic people and also how to help them feel confident in their identities and be part of our society and not feel ashamed for that. So that's something that I've been really excited about and working on as well. I just yeah. want to share things. I want this to be accessible to anybody. That's really great. And that's actually something I haven't thought about before is that independence piece. Um, Francesca and I are both SLPs, speech language pathologists, and a big goal that we have for our clients is to help them work toward independence. But it hasn't been very often that I've reflected on the fact that we all need help with independence or that we're not all fully independent. We always need to ask someone for some help in some way. So to be able to normalize that, asking for help, and then seeking ways to make help accessible for those who need it more, um, that's something that we can all work towards and start to normalize. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you about another book that you've written about specifically advice toward teenage girls who are navigating school and college. Boys are said to be four to five times more likely to have autism, but the more self-advocates that we hear from, we learn that maybe it's not until later in life that females realize that they have autism or that the signs are presented in different ways and, and they're able to get more resources. So tell us about your personal autism journey as a female and what that process was like receiving a diagnosis and maybe how your traits might differ from those that are considered to be stereotypically male autism. This is so interesting. So I think that the numbers are probably far more even. It's just that we're not as good at diagnosing women and gender non-conforming folks, mostly because of how the criteria for diagnoses are written. That a lot of it does come from very male-based stereotypes and even extreme male brain theory and all this very different stuff. And even when we were studying autism years and years ago, a lot of it was very 
boy focused. So I think that when we're starting to realize what we thought we knew isn't necessarily the only way to be autistic or the only understanding we have that's going to look a lot different as time goes on too. That's kind of just a quick caveat, but I really like that you mentioned a lot of folks were diagnosed later in life. That wasn't my story. I was actually diagnosed at three. So in many ways, I consider myself extremely lucky and privileged to have had access to services growing up and as a kid, because I know so many people don't. And I know that it's something that I don't take for granted. So I know that there's a lot of focus on early intervention and knowing at a young age and whether, however you feel about the ethics of different interventions and strategies. I think what's really important when we have people who are diagnosed in childhood is that they have access to services. So whether that's like an IEP or OT or speech language, any of all of these different things are a part of that puzzle of trying to help someone live their best life and trying to help them be their most autistic, wonderful human selves and be able to communicate and participate in society. So I think that's something that when we talk about children getting diagnosed, it's kind of the thing we miss out is we think of Early intervention equals better outcome, but what does that better outcome necessarily mean? That it means that we have tools, strategies, and that when we tell our young people that are autistic early on, they also have that self-understanding. They're not like, I know something is different about me, but I don't know what. And then they eventually discover that through either their own children or the internet or seeing some character on TV or whatnot. So I feel very lucky having been diagnosed as a kid. I found out when I was nine my mom compared it a lot to being like Harry Potter because at the time Harry Potter was my special interest. So I always thought that I was different, but I, I knew that I was different when she explained it to me, but I was told that different is neither better nor worse. It's just different and different could be extraordinary. So I grew up with this acceptance framework from the get-go. So, but I think for me, a lot of it was also masking. And I realized looking back on my earlier writing and work that I was kind of teaching people how to do it. I was teaching people how to mask because I, thought that was what you did. I didn't really know better. And I'm like, I felt like a lot of the time I was trying to fit in and I was very lucky that I wasn't bullied for being different. And I realized a lot of it is because I did have a lot of different coping strategies. And my goal was just to be accepted and kind of hide anything that was socially unacceptable. So I think that growing up as an autistic girl or young woman is very different because the social skills are different. There's all sorts of different cues that come into play. So whether it's clicks or makeup or things that you might not be interested in, you know that girls can be very competitive or very difficult socially and the social landscape is very difficult to navigate. I was always friends with guys growing up because it was a lot easier. It was easier to be like, oh, okay, you want to play games with me? Cool. Instant friendship. No, it wasn't like gossipy. It wasn't any of that other stuff. So growing up, I think that was really big, but I do think a lot of women get missed, so to speak, or undiagnosed or unidentified because the way that we have our criteria really focuses on boys. I think about this with ADHD as well, is that we think of boys who are neurodivergent and neurodivergence in general as being very disruptive, very loud, very at the center of attention, temper tantrums, meltdowns. We think of it very obvious in your face, trains. We think of all these things being extremely obvious. And then I was very quiet in school. I did not cry. I did not scream in school for the most part once I was verbal, mostly like I was very quiet. I was a teacher's pet. I would come home and cry and let out the anxiety from masking all day mm -hmm. and things like that. Is But if you ask my teachers about me, I was a very good kid. I did very well in school. Therefore, nothing was, you know, quote unquote, different or wrong. So I understand how a lot of girls and gender non-conforming and gender minorities get missed or undiagnosed because we think of a very specific image of autism. Right. And that's not even including different races and ethnicity too, because there's a lot of disparity or gaps between who is diagnosed with from Hispanic and Asian communities as well. So there's just so much work that needs to be done in this area. And I know a lot of people are afraid of getting that label, but like you said, it enabled you to receive services, which eventually helped you su succeed academically or socially. And I think as therapists or professionals who are working with different disabilities, it's important to be observant and notice maybe this label really no longer represents this person as much and we should do some more assessing and more evaluating and doing more check-ins because mm -hmm maybe they need different types of support than originally was uh, recommended for that individual. Exactly. And I think a lot of parents are afraid of labels because they're afraid this thing's going to haunt my child or it's going to make them 
stand out even more. And I think, don't think, I think the, the important thing is to view a label as an understanding. It's a jumping off point that it's the thing that makes it so you can access services. So you understand why these things are happening with your child or why they are acting the way they do. I think of it as a kind of a, and I think about this for a lot of adults who get diagnosed later in life, for them, it's the self-discovery tool is that they understand that they weren't just broken neurotypical people, that they were just different all along and that their brain works in its own wonderful, beautiful way. And they just didn't understand why that was and that they can get different strategies and tools and work with professionals or on their own or, with, or find community to be able to thrive. So I think that when we think about labels, denial doesn't help anybody. That I really, I know that we don't love labeling ourselves or defining ourselves in those ways, but so many times a label is a jumping off point. It's an understanding. It's a tool in your toolbox to be able to get what you need. And I think for parents, that's really important to understand is it's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to avoid. It could just be that door opening of maybe you do, your kid does need accommodations or you need help with different professionals that aren't just your child's teacher. Exactly. And as I've been trying to educate myself and read more about this topic, I'm finding that sometimes, even though there are accommodations in place, they're not always being implemented or maybe not implemented correctly for each individual person. If you feel comfortable sharing what kind of accommodations have been helpful for you and why do you think this is necessary and important? So you mentioned this earlier is that needs change as we get older and throughout the lifespan. So what I needed as a little kid is definitely not what I need now. I didn't receive a lot of accommodations in school. I did well academically but I really struggled making friends. So even things that were less formal, like even just introducing me to the new kids in class was something that would help is I think that everyone's different. And I know like at workplace, while I didn't need anything super formal at the time, I would be the kind of person who would like ask to wear headphones because I couldn't handle the fluorescent lights humming is that there are always, there's always things that you can do. However, formal or informal perhaps, or how much needs, it really just depends on the person. So I really think it's important that we take this on an individual case by case basis and not just assume across the board that autistic people or people with disabilities in general are a monolith and we all need the same things because we don't. So some people are really sensitive to touch and hate hugs. That's not me. I love hugs. I love being around people, but I also am one of those people that hates really crowded places and really loud noises. And I know people who are on the spectrum who are very gifted musicians. Meanwhile, certain jazz instruments are enough to send me into a sensory overload. So I think we have to understand that everyone has different strengths, weaknesses, and also might have different needs. So I know that I will, those types of things are my triggers for meltdowns because it's just so overwhelming to take in. It's so loud to me, it's so harsh. And then there are people who absolutely love it. So it's, I think accommodations really does need to be case by case, no matter what, and situational as well. Yes, I've been seeing a lot of graphics that demonstrate the autism spectrum differently than what we've traditionally mm -hmm. thought of it. It's not a less autistic to more autistic. It's more of a circle that has little pieces here, little pieces there. So that's just one demonstration of how accommodations are specific to the need of the person. And that does not look the same. And exactly. Is that there are people who are very communicative and others that struggle a lot with like executive functioning that's kind of me and then people assume that and of course when we look at it is that line you're just gonna go oh that person's high functioning and it doesn't mean anything because you're going be so I think it's always important that we name the specific needs and strengths and weaknesses rather than just give it a overall label in that case but I do love those circle graphics or those like spectrum of colors because it really does show that there are different areas that you can be really strong and others that you can just be absolutely terrible with. And that's exactly what the spectrum is, is that there's a variety of differences in those certain areas. So some people might have more sensory needs. Some might have more communication needs. Some might have more executive functioning needs or strengths and different interests. And it's really fascinating, honestly. Yeah. And that reminds me of what you mentioned in our previous episode of in terms of self-advocacy, starting off saying, I work best when I have these accommodations or I work best when I can use headphones in, in this scenario. So it kind of all ties it back to 
um, what what can be available if people feel comfortable coming forward and sharing mm -hmm. that with others. So cultivating that environment where people do feel comfortable to ask for help or to advocate for themselves. Absolutely. But I'd like to shift gears a little bit. This has been kind of a year of firsts for mm -hmm. everything and everyone. And I want to talk about how you were the first documented openly autistic attorney admitted to the Florida bar. What was that like for you? Was that a, a glass ceiling breaking moment or what did that feel like for you to be that first person to enter that space? Honestly, it's, I have a lot of feelings about this and they're all kind of mixed. So let me figure out how to best unpack this. In the moment when I got sworn into the bar, it was the best day of my life because I got to share it with my family. The entire firm came, the judge said all sorts of really cool stuff. I have all of it like on film and about being pioneers and trailblazers. Cause she was one of the, she was a pioneer for women judges in Florida and throughout the nation. And I really am, a, it was just so powerful. And I'm like, I just can't wait to start my career. And then it went viral like two weeks later. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is not what I expected. I didn't think of it as being a first at all. And then it, I thought, this probably isn't true. It's just the documented part that's true is people, there's plenty of autistic attorneys and I know I'm not the first and definitely not the first nationwide, definitely not the first in Florida. It's just a lot of people like we talked about last time too, have issues with disclosure or they're unidentified, especially folks of the older generations that we didn't identify and diagnose autism as much, or it was something to be ashamed of. So we have a very different take. And I think what really kind of also rubbed me in this mixed direction on it, on top of the fact that objectively, I don't think I'm the first because, and it shouldn't, and nor should I be the last for that matter, is I think that these are stories that we, how we tell these stories is something that's really important and we don't focus enough about. So I didn't always love the way my story was being told is if all you get from me is once I was a non-speaking three-year-old and now I'm an attorney, you didn't learn anything. It doesn't do anything. It makes you feel good about yourself that you were always speaking and you also are very accomplished. And I, I feel weird about that because that's not my story. It's a very oversimplified version of who I am and what I'm about. So I always, so something that I got to do, interestingly enough, when I went after going viral is I took control of the narrative. So I got to write about my own story. I got to write about those experiences. I got to write about stereotypes that women lawyers face, that autistic people face, that what neurodiversity at work is really all about. I got to really take control of what that looks like and what that feels like. And I think that was something that I needed to do because I didn't want my story to just be, once she was nonverbal, now she's a lawyer because that's not me. And also that's not who I wanted to be for the rest of my career and how I wanted to be defined for the rest of my career. I want to be seen as someone who is genuinely good at what they do, that they, yes, I'm autistic and that's a huge part of who I am, but bringing that perspective makes me a better attorney it makes me a better educator and it makes me the right person with that blend of first person and professional experience to be the one who is educating about neurodiversity and law, who's educating about workplace policy, that I'm the right person for that job, that it is not just because I'm the first of something and I'm certainly not going to be the last either. Exactly. And I think what is so unique and special about you is that you're multifaceted and you're kind of a jack of all trades. <laughs> you that's have true, none. different skill sets. And that's also uh, just from looking at your, your website and seeing all your different speaking engagements. I think that's what makes you also so marketable is people want to learn so many different things from you. Mm -hmm. And we discussed this a little bit before about public speaking, but you have a lot to share and public speaking can be a huge fear for a lot of people. So how did you navigate that and how do you continue to work in that area? And, and what kind of advice would you share to others who want to learn how to public speak and share their stories? Strangely enough, I was never afraid. So probably one of the most on-brand stories from my childhood is I was five years old at my uncle's wedding and I wanted to give the toast. And someone actually let me do it. And, it, and I did, and this is someone, and I was someone at five that barely talked to their peers in class. I was very shy around people, but crowds, I always felt very at ease. I think it was the fact that, you know, you have a captive audience and they're going to listen and you don't have to focus on one particular person. I guess, objectively, that might be kind of why I always gravitated to public speaking. I did drama as a kid. Like I loved being in front of a crowd. 
I do not like, I did not like being at the lunch table with five or six or eight people, but you put me in front of 500, I was fine. So I know that's not true for most people like you mentioned, but I always tell people when they're nervous, especially about interviews or even public speaking, just pretend you're talking to a friend. It kind of makes it a little bit easier. Because, and I think even with today, even, because I know a lot of people get nervous about things like podcasts, I'm like, just pretend you're talking to your friends. Just pretend you're talking about something that you're interested in and they want to listen. And it's a conversation. And I think that's something that I do with public speaking is I like to see it as you're talking to people who want to know. They care about the thing that you're normally afraid in any other social situation that you might just be saying way too much about the thing that interests you and making it all about you. But in a public speaking situation, people want to hear what you have to say. They're listening to you. It's a very different dynamic. The social rules don't apply. You don't have to make eye contact with one particular person. It's a very different set of rules. And I think for me, that was always very comforting in a way. But if that's something you want to work on, you, there's so many different ways. So whether it's joining a group like Toastmasters and working on public speaking with a group of people, whether it's doing acting or even some kind of advocacy or just somehow feeling comfortable with that. Because I know even for me, like trial, trial is a very different experience. Like public speaking in trial, because I did litigation skills when I was in law school and it was my favorite class I took and it did end in mock trials. Like I was so scared at trial and it was a, because it was a very different form of public speaking that you had to be very on. It was not always about what you found interesting. It was about convincing a group of people and also not having like your witnesses or the other side's witnesses catch you off guard. It was just very different. So I think understanding that a lot of things are very situational too is okay too. That I'm not normally a nervous speaker, but I know when we did trial, I was, I was terrified. <laughs> so I think as you do it more often, it gets a lot less nerve wracking. And especially if you know what you're going to say and it's something you're passionate about, you, you, you basically just get to info dump on people. You get to talk about the stuff you find interesting. You get to talk about what you want to talk about. Yeah, I love that outlook. And that gives a pretty fresh and new perspective for anyone that might be reluctant to, to speak publicly. And hopefully if there's anyone watching this who wants to advocate for themselves and be more public about their story, that gives you a little bit more of an eased feeling of approaching that because the people that are listening to you are there because they want to know about you. They are invested in your story. They, they want to support you on the, that endeavor. So thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. And something else I want to add to that when we talk about self-advocates sharing their stories, think about why you want to share that story or what you're hoping people walk away with from your story. So I mentioned before, I don't want people walking away thinking, oh, once upon a time, this person was nonverbal, now they're a lawyer. If that's all you walk away from, I failed at my job, plain and simple. Because I know people expect that from me. And I know that's what people want to get out of autistic people or people with disabilities. They want to feel inspired. They want to feel like it's not them in a way. They want to feel something because I think we're so used to people with disabilities being kind of objectified in that way. So for me, I always want people to feel inspired, but not for that. I want people to feel inspired that they can actually make a change. That's something that they learn from me. They can take back to their organizations, their classrooms, their personal lives, whatever it may be. So it's like, what can you genuinely, so I have to think about like, what is that message I want you to walk away with? What is something that the average person here feels might be able to feel that they can do that might not be too scary, but also challenges them at the same time. That challenges them almost within their comfort zone, just a little bit, because you don't want to make someone too uncomfortable. And you don't want to make someone also just feel cushy with where they are, feel good, like, wow, good thing that's not me. You want someone to really walk away feeling like their outlook might have changed more generally on disability. You might want someone to feel that there's something they can implement with their students or something like that. But you have to really think, like, what do you want people to walk away with? Why are you sharing this story about yourself? Why is this important? Is it that you want to get it off your chest? Is it that you want people to be more accepting, that you want professionals to understand that you're not just trying to bite their hands because you think it's fun and you think it, and that's just what you do when you're very anxious or you don't have the words to say no? Like, why are you sharing these very specific vignettes or why are you willing to be vulnerable about this thing? Or are you doing it because you're told you have to do it? Is it because you're trying to fundraise for a cause? I think understanding your why makes it so you're centered and knowing what you want people to walk away with. Yes, those are really great points. And 
That's something that I personally love about Spectrum Sundays and the community that we've created here is because we get to share all different perspectives. And, and then the point is brought that it's not just about a young autistic person overcoming these extreme obstacles. And now it's this huge inspiration mm -hmm. to get others to do the same thing or to look at them as other. That's not the point is to, to look at them as a superhero or look at people as if they've overcome something so tremendous. Mm -hmm. Our goal is hopefully to make a community, a stronger community that embraces diversity and that Absolutely. truly practices acceptance. So mm -hmm. what is something that you could share to encourage others to actively be involved in accepting and empowering the autism community? The fact that you're listening is such a great step. Please continue with that. I think listening is the best thing that you can do in always amplifying those voices that you listen to. So a lot of it, think about it like when you see artwork that you love, even if you can't afford to buy the artwork, you might tell your friends about the artwork. You might somehow feel inspired by it and say that that person inspired you in your own work or whatever it might be. Same with like small businesses. And I think when we talk about people who are advocating, it's very similar, especially if it is also related to their business or whatever it may be or whatever their agenda might is, or maybe it's selling books. Maybe it's getting book for speaking engagements. Maybe it's getting something passed that even if you don't feel that you can tangibly do something. And I think a lot of people think they don't have time to volunteer or they don't have money to give to something. How can you still amplify this? So you learn something, how can you pay it forward? Even just crediting me when you share my words is amplifying because sometimes people will share a quote that you say and they'll get a bajillion likes on it and they don't even know who said it or you don't even know that they're using your words out there. So even just a tag on social media is a great way to amplify somebody. It's a simple thing to do, of course, if they're com comfortable with it. But I think amplifying is a very doable next step once you're listening is how do you be like, wow, I learned so much from this person, not an account because I think we're people and a lot of people think that a lot of influencers or people who post educational content or accounts, not people, we're people. If it's like, oh, wow, look how much I learned from this person and what they put out into the world. That it's this person I learned from, not the, oh, I learned this on social media. You learn this from this person. Make sure to give credit where credit is due. That it's a very simple thing we can each do very actionably and say, hey, I learned a lot from X, Y, and Z or so-and-so. You should check this out. That it's a very easy way to pay it forward, even if you don't want to give money or you don't have time to volunteer or you don't want to pay for services or whatever it might be. Amplifying is a huge thing you can do for anybody. I think that goes for all social justice, not just autistic people, but autistic people, I think, need it extra because so often we're, we're used to everyone else being the authorities on speaking about autism, and that's who has been traditionally amplified. It's parents and siblings and professionals and not actually autistic people. Right. And that's why we love having different guests like you, because your voices are what really matters. We shape all of our goals. Our entire career is shaped around what our individuals want out of life and what skills they want to learn. Um, mm -hmm. And I think to come back to the point of how you were talking about different ways and different, the community, community can be involved by either donating money or using their resources. There's different in types of impact and levels of impact that go in with that. And I think the, the way the community can have the most impact with the neurotypical, with the neurodiverse community is by actively listening and being open-minded to a shifting perspective on what they might've previously thought because what our mindsets are will can last a lifetime. Whereas money and scholarships and Mm -hmm. volunteering time might be just temporary mm -hmm. so as we're as we are trying to break stereotypes and misconceptions of autism do you think that there are a, spe a specific set of stereotypes that are more harmful than others or more important to clarify I think so and I think it really evolves honestly as time goes on too and even if you follow the news cycle it's very difficult to have to deal with some of the stuff that shows up in the news cycle as an autistic person. So even just when they say that the one of the rioters from January 6th, that he's autistic and that's what the argument the lawyer's using, imagine having to combat those stereotypes of that 
we're violent, that we're school shooters, that we're insurrectionists. Like imagine having to combat that and say, no, that's not representative of autistic people. This is someone scapegoating a community to throw under the bus to get their client out of going to prison. Like imagine having to deal with that or like when someone like Elon Musk makes their announcement that they're autistic and then everyone goes, oh, look, another tech billionaire, another tech dude who's a stereotypical STEM genius is autistic, congratulations. And that this person has also been harmful to the community in so many ways too. Like just watching the news cycle, you really kind of get more aware of what things need to be addressed first and foremost is that we do have these stereotypes about violence, about being harmful to other people. And that we do have these stereotypes about STEM and boys and men that also harm women and people of color and other minor, like multiply marginalized people, not just minorities, but like people who are at the margins of society. So I think it's really kind of important that when we look at what stereotypes are addressing, it's what do we think we know? What are we being told? And how do we combat that threat of misinformation and making those stereotypes get bigger? And a lot of that ultimately does come from media. So a lot of stereotypes of these boys and men starts with what we see on TV. Think about Rain Man being the first like movie about an autistic adult. Rain Man came out before I was born. And I still get asked like, oh, so like Rain Man, no. So there's a lot to be done when it comes to stereotypes and relearning and rethinking what we know. Yeah, and I think- and what we do get in the news cycle or even on TV and movies can last a long time. Just that's why I always remind people Rain Man is older than me. And I think that's a really good point to say about how important representation is of actually autistic people in movies and in documentaries so that the story isn't being told for them, but the Mm -hmm. story is being told by them and it's being accurately represented in media because unfortunately Mm -hmm. the media that we receive we have to be very intentional about what we ingest Mm -hmm. and and how we're going to process that and what we're going to internalize so the more that we can have also what we amplify (laughs) yes exactly so the more that we can involve actually autistic people in those conversations and to speak publicly about it i think can really help combat those misconceptions and show that there's Mm -hmm. more than meets the eye when it comes to autism absolutely and that's why even when we do get like women on the spectrum being portrayed on TV, I get really excited because that's not something we usually would get. Mm -hmm. Is when I think about it, I'm like, was there ever a character who acted like me explicitly? And the answer was usually no. And, but there are figments of other characters that were either coded or neurotypical, but still had some of those traits in a way that I would cling to. So like growing up, I related a lot to Hermione Granger because I always raised my hand. I always had the answers. I like, that felt like me, but I know that Hermione, I don't think was written as an autistic character, but there are things like that I cling to. And then the autistic characters that were on TV, I'm like, I don't have that much in common with them. I don't relate to this person. They look like a list of diagnostic symptoms and traits. Like I found that very frustrating. And I know when you see autistic characters, like even on like, everything's gonna be okay now, I feel a lot better about it is that the characters are played by autistic actors, things like that too. It's like, this feels, more real like it's not my story but it still feels like people I know Mm -hmm. that I feel like well-written autistic characters feel like composites of the autistic people that I know yeah and that just demonstrates that there's more than one type of autism there's more than one look to it or feel and sound to it Mm -hmm. so we talked off camera (laughs) about what you might see yourself doing in five to 10 years. So we're gonna ask you that dreaded question now. What do you see coming up in your future? What are some things that you hope to accomplish or that you look forward to? I'm not 100% sure what I'll be doing in five years. I hope that I am, I hope that I'm happy, honestly. Like I love what I do now, but I hope that I still have that passion. I hope that I'm still excited about something even if it's not advocacy and inclusion every day because ideally this job doesn't need to exist. (laughs) <laughs> like in fantasy land we wouldn't need the stuff because we would be that accessible and inclusive to begin with that we don't need people who have to shout from the rooftops about it that the dream job is having my job not exist as weird as that sounds not because I want to retire more of because we shouldn't need to have these conversations that we're having now that imagine a world where this isn't necessary where we're already at that point of acceptance and understanding and took action like that's something that I think about a lot so in fantasy land we'd already be there in five years but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. 
I hope that is it during my lifetime, however long that may be. I know that I want to be happy. I know that like everybody else, I want to just feel fulfilled. I want to be successful, whatever that means to me. So I think people think of success as this very yellow brick road, but I want to feel that. And I want that confidence. I want that happiness. I want that security, just like anybody else. And I always hear of the word happiness being portrayed as a verb instead of a noun. It's not something you're always chasing, but something you just, I just want to feel it. Right. And I want to feel it like sustainably, not like in like little bursts when I'm old. Right. And I think what we do every day in our lives can help achieve that level of satisfaction, especially when we accomplish a goal or the little things when we get feedback from someone knowing that we've made a difference in their lives. It, it can really help attain those lifelong goals. But we focused a little bit about what you're, you want to do and achieve in the future. But right now you're still doing a lot of things between writing your books and you also co-host a podcast called Spectrumly Speaking. So could you share a little bit about this project and maybe other resources that individuals who want to learn more about autism can go to? Absolutely. So Spectrumly is the podcast that is by and for women on the autism spectrum. So every couple of weeks when we actually have time to record, we rile up our favorite experts and autistic voices, particularly women and non-binary folks that are able to speak about different topics related to autism and life that might be relevant to our friends who love autistic women and non-binary people, as well as those who are actually autistic and non-binary people too, and women. So it's really just important to me. And something that since I started co-hosting Spectrumly is that the majority of our guests usually are autistic women or non-binary folks, which really just feels powerful to have because a lot of times people just want to talk to experts and sometimes we get experts who are autistic as well, which is even better. And it's just really powerful. And I feel like the best part for me of hosting Spectrumly is I learn a lot from every guest that we've had. So we've had uncomfortable conversations about race. We've had conversations about people who are autistic and transgender or non-binary. And we had a non-binary autistic therapist on the show who explained how to be more supportive and we learned about pronouns and like what if we screwed up because we were all very nervous I think before recording and they were so helpful for us and I know I learned a lot and like I think that's the coolest part is I learn a lot with every person that I get to talk to but I think as far as resources, every year I try to update a resource guide that I wrote on certain topics because people always ask me where to go and I don't always have the best answers. But I think for a lot of people, some great starting points usually are things like the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network and the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network because I think people want that content from autistic people. And also there's so much community from social media. There's so many great books as well. So I read a lot. I need to put out like a new book list of things I think are really interesting, not talking about myself, but I read a lot anyway. So there's always something. And I think about what do I, even when I teach my college class, like what do I assign my students and what do I want them to know? Because they get a semester of like neurodiversity education after learning medical model for an entire semester. And it's really fun kind of having to undo that with them and make them think a little bit more critically. So I think how can I do what I do with them, but for anybody who just wants resources and information and information that's reliable and fair and also from autistic people and creators. Well, thank you for all of those suggestions. It sounds like Spectrumly is also a great place for people to start to hear from actually autistic voices and to hear what they're looking for and searching for and what can be hopefully done in our community to make it stronger and more supportive. So thank you so much for being on Spectrum Sundays, Haley. We have greatly appreciated the time that you've spent with us, and we're just so excited for our audience to learn all that you have to share with them. Absolutely, and thank you both for having me and taking the time to speak with me, and hopefully we all learn something today too, because I always enjoy the best part of my job, honestly, is the people, and I learn a lot from everyone that I get to talk to, and I hope that they learn something from me too. Well, thank you. So if you're watching this and you enjoyed this episode and would like to learn more about Haley, please make sure to check out her first episode with us, which was episode number 61. And you can also visit her website at HaleyMoss.net. You can find her on Instagram and Twitter at HaleyMossArt, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash HaleyMossArt, and on LinkedIn, HaleyMossESQ. Thank you, everyone, and we will see you next Sunday.
Thank you for listening to Spectrum Sundays. We are your hosts, Miss Central Pennsylvania, Megan Sinisi. And Miss Thousand Islands, Francesca D'Alessandro. Please make sure to subscribe to our series and follow us on social media to stay connected to autism professionals and self-advocates. And just remember, true impact is accomplished through active listening and exploring the world through a variety of perspectives. Join us next week on Spectrum Sundays to help cultivate a community of inclusion, appreciation, and acceptance around autism. 